So good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to International Weekly Meeting in association with Samao COVID edition. We are on 28th of August, 2021, 9.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time. And we have a lot of national medical representatives joining in from various parts of the world. Uh, so good evening, good morning, and good afternoon for depending on where you are. Uh, it is our efforts to bring a lot of uh, new topics, relevant topics, COVID, non-COVID. Uh, a lot of countries are still facing pandemic. Uh, some of them are facing third wave. Malaysia is still struggling. Uh, and similarly, you know, India is also at a stage where the cases are stagnant. Uh, we have about 45,000 cases reported last day. And uh, Kerala has been covering about 75% cases. So we will cover up this amount, uh, you know, the COVID update after the presentation. But today we have uh, one of the very important topics, which are, uh, which is the need of the hour. Uh, I will introduce the topic later. Let me first introduce the person. So we have Dr. Dhananjay Vaidya. Uh, he's joining in from the US. So. Uh, uh, I thank you uh, for him to join him for, because it's a midnight for him. Uh, he's the Associate Professor of Medicine in General Internal Medicine Department at John Hopkins, State Uni John Hopkins University. He studied mechanism of vascular dysfunction and the assessment of cardiovascular risk factor. His special interest is in the difference in the heart between the women and men and the role of sex hormones in the risk of heart disease. Dr. Vaidya holds Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, MBBS degree from Armed Forces Medical College and PhD from State University in New York. He earned his master degree of public health degree from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health before joining in John Hopkins faculty. And today he presents a topic, sex hormones, menopause, and the risk of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Over to you, Dr. Jay Vaidya. Thank you for thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation to present. And uh, I will let you share your slides as well. So Great. We have, Great. Yeah. Oh, you've uh, 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 you also made me a host, so I'm getting these messages about people joining. But okay, okay so I will I will remove. Uh, yeah, I know that's irritating. So I'll I'll give you the no, that's share good. screen no, no, that's good. thing, and I will remove you as a co-host because it 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 really irritates. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, let me see if I'm doing the right. Uh, uh, okay, I think this is the this is the correct uh, screen that is being shared. Am I sharing the? Am I sharing a uh, my PowerPoint uh, Absolutely. slide? Absolutely, we can see that now. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to the CMAO and the Heart Care Foundation of India for uh, this very kind invitation. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, talking to you. Uh, I know that the. Uh, uh, this is the my topic is as uh, you said uh, my my research is in sex hormones menopause the risk of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I know that uh, this uh, this assembly is uh, particularly interested in COVID, so I'm going to have a really really uh, short intro with a couple of slides about uh, heart failure in the age of COVID. But I must really. Uh, uh, I must say that this is not at all my field of research, and I stand to actually uh, gain education uh, by any conversation that uh, that is sparked by the two or three slides that I'm presenting about heart failure and COVID. And then I will go on to my uh, the topic of my research, which is broader. It's about uh, sex hormones, menopause, and heart disease. Uh, this uh, much of well, the research is all done before the age of COVID. Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the studies were from before the age of COVID. So uh, just to uh, bring, um, just to uh, put a practical definition of what, uh, of this word that I'll be using often, it is 
HEFPEF. HEFPEF is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the P is small because there is such a thing as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was called preserved because the function of the left ventricle, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is more than or equal to 50%. So it is, uh, in terms of numbers, it is normal. And yet, uh, patients have signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure. So the heart is not moving as much blood as it's supposed to move. And uh, so those are the signs and symptoms. And uh, there are, uh, practically, there should also be some kind of objective uh, uh, evidence of a heart problem either elevated uh, brain natriuretic peptide, BNP, which is also, which is uh, a measurement that is very uh, much related to heart failure. I will mention it again and again. Uh, so left atrial enlargement. So the uh, atrium of the heart, uh, it, it, it backs up and it, because the ventricle is not pumping enough blood. So the left atrium backs up. Uh, there will be mention of this within uh, my research. Diastolic dysfunction, uh, elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and uh, elevated uh, left ventricular diastolic pressure. Uh, so this uh, paper, this is a figure from a paper that came out, uh, I think, in the middle of 2020, when uh, it, when people were uh, really concerned about the initial big waves of uh, COVID and here were a number of cardiologists specializing in heart failure that were looking far ahead into the future and uh, seeing like heart failure is going to be a big problem uh, that uh, that is going to interact with co the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, I hope uh, uh, it, you can see my uh, my pointer. What the, uh, at that time there was not enough data available, but this is what uh, they they came up from their uh, from our knowledge of. Uh, how heart failure works and our knowledge at that time of how, what was important about COVID-19. And one is that there are many shared cardiovascular uh, disease factors. Older age, obesity, metabolic syndrome are all uh, related to heart failure, but and they were also related to with worse COVID-19 uh, yeah. outcomes. Uh, there's a shared inflammatory pathogenesis here are a number of uh, uh, blood biomarkers that are either directly inflammatory or markers of inflammation. And both of them would be associated with COVID-19 infection on one hand and cardiac failure, uh, heart failure on the other hand. But once there's uh, uh, an acute COVID infection, there are all of these factors, hypoxemia, acute respiratory dispo, uh, distress syndrome, further in, uh, acute inflammation happening because of the infection, a hypercoagulable state, and direct viral in, uh, myocarditis, uh, infiltration of the heart, and that could later get to more heart failure. So in a, at an acute level, there would be more heart failure because they share the same risk factors. In the long term, after COVID, there would be heart failure again. And there's also the long-term illness. Uh, uh, if, the, uh, if the lungs are uh, damaged, uh, that will uh, that will also cause the heart to remodel badly, and that will lead to heart failure in uh, in the future. So let's see. Uh, since the mid 2020, there have been some uh, there is some uh, data that have been published. This is a medium large, uh, uh, you know, 2,500, uh, 2,000, uh, a little less than 3,000 people. This is a study a registry study uh, from France where they uh, studied hospitalized patients, those that had uh, those that had heart failure and those that did not have heart failure. Here, if you just think of heart failure per se, you will you'll see that uh, those that did not have heart, uh, COVID will, uh, uh, will cause events. Here are deaths or uh, uh, death, uh, deaths or intubation. Uh, and so, uh, there, there are events in everyone, but if the if people started off with heart failure, they came, uh, then they had worse event rate. Uh, I, I hope people are aware of these this diagram. It's a survival curve. You start off with 100% of the people not having events, and as time goes on, in uh, many days, there are fewer and fewer people. More, so uh, more and more people have events. There are fewer and fewer people that remain surviving without events. Now, if you uh, so it turns out that the overall 
uh, hazard ratio, which is another technical term which many of you are aware of. It is a sense, it is a way that risk is assessed in, uh, uh, in uh, survival analyses. And is uh, so there's 1.41 uh, fold, so 41% more risk of uh, having a death or intubation event in, uh, if, in people who had heart failure. But if they, when they split out uh, people who had uh, uh, heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction, they found that it was much stronger with people with uh, preserved ejection fraction as compared to reduced ejection fraction. So 61% higher risk, 1.61 fold is 61% higher risk in uh, people with uh, re uh, with uh, preserved ejection fraction. So that's. Uh, that tells you that one of the things that uh, uh, the uh, 2020 paper was talking about is that if you have heart failure, COVID could be worse. Looks like uh, that makes sense. And uh, this is a much smaller study looking at the other side. If you did not have heart failure, but have COVID, are you, is heart failure going to happen afterwards? So they looked at, uh, this is a smaller study, of course. They looked at 64 people uh, who were hospitalized with COVID, 64 people who were hospitalized without COVID, and uh, uh, they all started uh, with no history of heart failure. And then they uh, measured this uh, HFA PEF score, which is a mixture of clinical and laboratory findings. Uh, and uh, so if the score is low, it is uh, there's a low probability that uh, HFPEF is a problem. If the pro score is high, there's a high probability that HFPEF is a problem. Found that 25% of the people who, uh, who were hospitalized with COVID uh, were, uh, had a high score of, uh, uh, pos high probability of uh, HFPEF. When uh, with uh, same age, same uh, sex uh, people, uh, uh, without COVID, a um, far smaller group looked like they had a high probability of COVID. So again, it's, uh, this looks like this two-way relationship. If you have heart failure, worse COVID, if you have COVID, there's a good, uh, there's a worse chance that you might proceed to heart failure at some point if that's where you're going. Uh, my main, uh, con my main uh, uh, topic later is going to be about sex, sex hormones, and uh, there is not much data available. This we have only one year uh, which of this uh, of this tragedy going on, so we don't have a lot of uh, long-term data. We know that men have overall worse outcomes than women. But uh, the rest of them are open questions. So I have uh, mentioned a review from the uh, by Haithau and others, and uh, some of the they have raised some open questions that uh, should be studied. One is that menopause in women uh, is a worse inflammatory state, uh, and there is oxidative stress, both of which are problematic in COVID. Uh, how does how do those two things interact? We don't know, for example, if hormone replacement therapy in men and separately uh, in men that there's a completely different biology, how they might affect uh, COVID-19 uh, pathophysiology. The, we don't know. Uh, we know uh, as far as uh, the uh, data are published that the association of cardiac biomarkers with outcomes. So if you have worse cardiac biomarkers, you have worse uh, COVID outcomes. That does not differ by sex. So having worse cardiac biomarkers is bad both for men and women. However, older women often have worse uh, to begin with. They start off with worse cardiac biomarkers, uh, especially uh, uh, heart failure related uh, subclinical biomarkers. So we don't know whether women who, uh, who start off with higher biomarkers are going to have worse COVID outcomes. So. Uh, this is just uh, my slight two or three slides uh, to talk about some of the work that has been published about COVID and heart failure. Again, not my uh, specialty at all. And any conversation that is sparked is going to be educational for me from this group. Uh, going to uh, my topic now, this is uh, this is broad beyond COVID. Uh, just looking at heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, first, looking at uh, sex, men versus women. How how does it differ? 
and uh, uh, I work in the United States, so uh, a lot of my data are going to be from the United States. Uh, so here was a, uh, is a publication from 2006 that looked back at a few decades, and we have been and sh showing that the. Uh, uh, the fraction of people who had preserved rather than reduced ejection fraction has been increasing for the last few decades. If, if plotting together those with preserved ejection fraction in the uh, in the uh, red orange and uh, reduced ejection fraction, you see that the increase is only in the preserved ejection fraction. The reduced ejection fraction people have been sort of a flat. Uh, I know that it looks slightly reducing, but uh, more or less uh, not changing, at least not increasing. So uh, this is something that people have been um, knowing that they're, 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 this is a public health issue. And uh, there is a sense that uh, because of the name preserved, preserved has this very nice sound, like something good is happening. Uh, this, is, this is not uh, true in terms of uh, uh, how bad the disease is. So this is another uh, survival curve also published in uh, 2006 which shows the how uh, which the, the people start surviving and as as they die the curve goes down you see that the preserved ejection people with preserved ejection fraction versus reduced ejection fraction a lot of them are uh, uh, not surviving within 5 years there's less than 40% uh, of people surviving and it's the same whether it's preserved ejection fraction or not and uh, just to put it uh, in a broad medical uh, field if you, uh, how about let's compare it to a kind of cancer that kills so many people in uh, in within five years, and so we can see that uh, if we overlay the data for uh, T4 small cell lung cancer, it sort of overlays. So this is a stage three B cancer of the uh, of um, lung cancer. So it's that kind of a uh, rapid decline in uh, survival. Uh, one of the bad things about preserve uh, hef pef uh, compared to hef ref, uh, I'm trying to do more and more and more things to convince you that the P of preserve is not something to be happy about. Is that uh, many treatments uh, have been shown to be effective in uh, in uh, hef reduced hef ref, and so here this uh, this was a. Uh, summary that was published in circulation in 2011, they looked at uh, many different trials with uh, several different therapies, uh, ACE inhibitors, digital ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. Uh, they found, uh, and again, uh, this the hazard ratio is, when the hazard ratio is less than one, it means that the treatment is protective. The dotted line here means that uh, that is a sign of the null hypothesis, no, no difference between uh, uh, treated and placebo population or the uh, uh, so for many many trials they showed that hef ref when you treat it uh, the uh, the hazard ratio is uh, is clearly uh, protective so the treatment works but the same treatments given to uh, hef pef uh, all of them they cross the null as which means that the treatment is no better than the uh, comparison so uh, there's that. Uh, just to uh, 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 another thing to show the epidemiology of the disease. Uh, here we have plotted ejection fraction from zero to 100. Uh, so higher and higher ejection fraction. The, the ventricle is pumping more and more blood uh, as a percentage uh, of its volume. And what percentage of patients? The purple is men. And you see that, uh, sure, both men and women have all kinds of uh, ejection fractions, but the peak for men is with low ejection fraction, and for the peak for women is with high ejection fraction. So it tells that, yes, uh, the, the disease is present both in men and women, but there is some difference. So sex uh, or something to do with uh, differences between men and women, though it's not 100%, it can be modulating this really dangerous disease. Uh, another way to look at it is to look at it in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, how uh, heart failure is related to age. This is a, a study published in 2017 about United States data. And as you can imagine always that uh, as uh, people are older and older, there is a greater prevalence of uh, HEF-PEF. Uh, uh, 
uh, but you'll see that it is a very steep increase in women and uh, there's an increase in men as well which is the purple line but not uh, as steep uh, when it comes to hef ref uh, men have more of it the, but you'll see that both men and women have the same uh, shallow uh, increase with age uh, so again to tell you that uh, sex uh, being a man or woman uh, does not make it one way or the other but it probably modulates this disease so to summarize, HFPEF is a form of heart failure that is increasing in prevalence. Uh, I've shown United States data. Uh, HFPEF is, causes as much morbidity, mortality as HFREF. HFPEF is refractory to treatment. Uh, and HFPEF is more common in women, suggesting that the mechanism may be modulated by sex. So uh, one of the big differences between uh, men and women is uh, that both men and women have the same sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone is present both in men and women, but the quantities are very, very different in men and women. So we decided to look at uh, how that uh, modulates, how that modulates heart failure. So uh, not just heart failure, we look for uh, a broader, uh, uh, a broader array of cardiovascular disease and just risk factors even. So. Uh, this is uh, this is data from uh, a population-based study called MESA. It is uh, uh, it is looking at people uh, 45 and older. The women are pretty much all postmenopausal, and we saw so the um, the estrogen that is present in postmenopausal women is not coming from the menstrual cycle. It is coming from uh, the adrenal glands. It is a very very small amount of estrogen. Uh, testosterone is being produced by the adrenal glands as well. But you'll see that there is a difference between what sex hormones do in women and sex hormones do in men when we are looking at waist to hip ratio. So people with large waist to hip ratios have more central adiposity, big waists compared to their hips. So having higher testosterone makes, makes for smaller waist to hip ratio in men. The blue is men, but for uh, women, it's almost going the other way around. Estrogen uh, this is a different kind of estrogen than the, uh, than, uh, the premenopausal estrogen. This postmenopausal is higher. Uh, the more the estrogen, the bigger the waist, uh, so more central adiposity. DHEA is an, a pro-hormone. It doesn't show that much. And SHBG is sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin is a protein that carries sex hormones and affects how sex hormones act. And it has many positive uh, uh, effects on the body and so uh, the more there is of sex hormone binding globulin there is the the less the waist uh, uh, to hip ratio is both in women and men uh, so there are there are other metabolic factors so if you are looking at uh, diabetes who has diabetes so this uh, little uh, the graph on the top shows uh, uh, the prevalent uh, the odds of diabetes so odds uh, so the odds of diabetes uh, in women, uh, prevalent diabetes. So at the same time as the sex hormones were measured, as the, the testosterone is higher and higher, there is a greater chance of diabetes in women. As estro estrogen, it is a very similar pro uh, thing as we saw with central obesity. As estrogen is higher, there is, mo there is more diabetes. As DHA, we saw that it was not very strong. And as SHBG is higher, SHBG is protective. So uh, there is less diabetes. Now that's in women uh, at the same time as measuring the sex hormones. If you look for incident uh, future diabetes after measuring the sex hormone, we also see it's very similar. The higher testosterone, higher estrogen, and lower sex hormone binding globulin will uh, will cause development of new diabetes after afterwards, even in people who didn't start off with diabetes. In men, just as we saw with the obesity, uh, lower testosterone and higher estradiol is associated with uh, more worse impaired fasting glucose and diabetes. Uh, we also looked uh, at the uh, association of sex hormones with uh, the progression of CAC. CAC is coronary artery calcium. I've shown a small uh, picture here of a of a, a CT scan at the level of the heart. That's the, the it's a it's a cross section. So you see the rib cage with the heart in the middle, and you can actually see the uh, calcium that is deposited. These are the strong white lines that you can see are calcium that is deposited in the uh, coronary arteries. It is a plaque, 
And so the more the calcium, the worse the plaque. And when we look at uh, the 10 year increase, we are looking at the ratio. So ratio of one means the increase is no increase. But if it is a number that is larger than one, it's just a 26% increase. So people with, with uh, more testosterone at, uh, at baseline, these are, uh, these are all women, postmenopausal women, they have a 26% increase in the amount of calcium deposited in their uh, plaques uh, over 10 years. Uh, this is this diagram shows it. Uh, so people with uh, with high uh, is the red and low testosterone. People is women. These are postmenopausal women. They start off approximately the same, but as you look, as you follow them up over years, the uh, the red line uh, shoots up and crosses the uh, and becomes a, a much higher amount of uh, coronary artery calcium. Uh, how does uh, sex hormones, uh, uh, how are they associated with change in left ventricular mass? So left ventricular mass, uh, the left ventricular mass, especially in the, an aging uh, population, uh, can be uh, a sign that the heart is under stress. It has too much load, so it has to increase in size to, uh, to pump more blood. And uh, so uh, here again, we see, uh, and here's a picture, this is from, from a pathology study, just showing that how thick the heart can get if it, uh, if it has too much load on it. So having more pre-testosterone associate, was associated here, zero means no change. This is a different kind of analysis. Here, positive means that the size is increasing. So the size is, uh, was, it was increasing uh, with people uh, who had more with women who had more testosterone this is a very this is an interesting way to look at it to to see that free testosterone levels versus how much the increase was and the increase is really not that much for uh, uh, low to medium levels of testosterone it, the it's mainly at high levels of uh, uh, testosterone that uh, that this uh, bad effect uh, is is seen uh, how does sex hormones affect uh, the distensibility of the arteries? Distensibility uh, is a good thing. Distensibility is a supple artery. If an artery is supple, it, the, the heart does not have as much of a load to, uh, to pump against. And what we can see again, so here a negative number is a bad thing. So uh, is a, uh, the distensibility is less, it is less supple. So the more the testosterone in postmenopausal women, the less the distensibility. So the arteries are getting less supple. The heart has to work hard and the heart has to th thicken to work uh, hard. Here's a picture of the MRI uh, of the, the aorta, of the sort of data that uh, is used to measure the suppleness, the distensibility of the aorta. And uh, just to uh, one more thing, this is, we also were able to study vascular reactivity, which is, uh, which is a good function, which can, uh, it can be studied in the brachial artery, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is very easily studied. Brachial artery does not get atherosclerosis, but we can actually see how well it reacts to, uh, to a blood pressure cough being uh, um, inflated and losing oxygen. How does it react? And uh, re if it reacts, that's a good thing. So what, again, if it, uh, a negative number is, does not react well, and we know that women, postmenopausal women who have higher levels of testosterone, uh, the brachial artery reacts less. So I'm just saying more and more uh, evidence in many different uh, ways to study the vascular, having more uh, testosterone in postmenopausal women is not uh, healthy for their vasculature. Uh, Going now much closer to heart failure, I talked about uh, uh, brain natriuretic peptide in the beginning. Brain natriuretic peptide is a, uh, it's, the, the name was given a long time ago. Uh, it is actually, uh, uh, it comes out from the heart, it comes out of a stressed heart. It is, a, on a molecular level, it is a protective uh, mechanism. But the fact that it is being splurged out by the heart is because the heart is under stress. So sometimes we, I'm going to show many other things which are uh, on a molecular level protective for the heart, but the fact that you find them uh, floating around in the plasma means that the heart is in, a, in, a, in distress. Again, so having higher amount of testosterone is associated with larger um, uh, amount of uh, uh, of uh, NT pro BNP, uh, which is a, uh, a lab measure of uh, brain atriuretic peptide. 
uh, estrogens here, interestingly, they here uh, this is a ratio. So one means no change. More than one means 16% higher. For five means 5% uh, lower than uh, than no change. So uh, again. Uh, now we are looking at uh, how much do CVD events, that is um, uh, heart attacks, strokes, uh, um, heart failure happen based on how much what the sex hormone levels were. And it turns out that in postmenopausal women having high testosterone, uh, we already showed all of these bad things in terms of imaging. But if you wait, then they, uh, having high testosterone means there'd be a 14% higher chance of uh, having uh, cardiovascular events. Most of those are coronary artery disease events. Uh, but uh, really, it is an interplay between uh, testosterone and estradiol. So the higher the ratio, you will see that it's a, it's a stronger association. Uh, cardiovascular disease is 19% more likely if there are people with higher ratio. Not only do they have more cardio coronary artery disease, they also have a lot of heart failure. So uh, uh, to summarize all of these, what we have shown is to, uh, to have more androgens in a postmenopausal woman is associated with more central obesity, worse impaired fasting glucose, more type 2 diabetes, fast, faster progression of atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries, more left ventricular mass, which is uh, increasing because the heart is working against a higher load, lower our aortic distensibility, which means the arteries are less supple and producing that higher load, greater increase in uh, NT pro BNP, again, a sign that the heart is going to, is uh, trying to protect itself, but it's over uh, producing this thing. So it's going towards failure. And if you wait long enough, greater risk of cardiovascular disease uh, events even. So uh, mo all of what I presented earlier was about studies we did in postmenopausal women. But one of the biggest changes in, uh, in sex hormones in women happens with menopause. So what is the, uh, how does menopause play with uh, cardiovascular disease risk? And uh, so this is just a, 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 a background. Uh, we know that how women have lower heart disease mortality as compared to men of the same age. Uh, and the increase in heart disease mortality is after uh, is later in life. So uh, mostly after menopause. So here are some data again from the US. They are from the, uh, a nationwide study called the National Health and Nutrition Survey. And uh, what we have here is the percent of the population that, ha that had uh, existing uh, cardiovascular disease. The blue is the men and the orange are the women. And for younger women, you for younger people, we see that men have more cardiovascular disease than women. But as they age, the women not only catch up, they actually uh, overshoot the men uh, in terms of how many people, uh, how many women have cardiovascular disease. So again, it gives us the sense that uh, somewhere between uh, uh, 40 and 60 years of age, there is this overtaking happening. So they develop uh, CVD seven to 10 years later, but once they develop, they develop it quite as much and more. Uh, this is uh, uh, some data from uh, the study, if a really nice study called the SWAN study, where they, where they enrolled younger women before menopause and uh, studied them every year so that they knew exactly when menopause took place and they had measurements before and after menopause for these women. And they found that that LDL cholesterol, which is uh, the bad cholesterol, uh, it sort of increases, but there's this kind of a step increase at the same time that they had menopause. Uh, the APO, uh, APOB, which is which uh, follows uh, the same track as LDL cholesterol, also has a step increase at the time of menopause. HDL cholesterol. Uh, which is a good cholesterol was uh, looked like it was increasing before menopause but after menopause it started decreasing now uh, we know that age uh, is itself uh, uh, danger uh, per se not just menopause many many things uh, just keep changing with age not with menopause i don't want to make uh, this point that menopause is the answer to everything there are lots of things that uh, that i have mentioned here that don't 
that just change with age and not with menopause. And yet, I want to show that there are some important things that menopause just puts a step increase and makes it makes them worse for the heart. So to summarize uh, this part, heart disease mortality increases with age, both men and women throughout adulthood. Uh, however, the causes of heart disease, what, how exactly uh, it manifests are different. And there may be changes occurring uh, in the internal milieu that happen, uh, like uh, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol that I showed, that, that happen at menopause time in women. So uh, now I'm going to try to put uh, all of these uh, topics together, uh, menopause, sex hormones, and uh, uh, HEF-PEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, one of the things that helped me put it together was uh, a, a very nice collaboration that, ha that uh, happened in our uh, universe, uh, in our uh, institution called the Go Red Center for uh, uh, Women's Heart Disease. And we have uh, basic science uh, researchers who can work on animal models and actually look at mechanism. We have clinical researchers doing uh, clinical trials. And we have people like me who are uh, epidemiologists who do observational work. And this is what uh, we uh, we came up from our uh, putting our heads together. So we know that uh, HEFPEF uh, is a disease of the heart that causes hypertrophy, fibrosis, dysfunction. Uh, there, it, it it's actually a disease of the whole body. There is uh, there is a higher adiposity, skeletal muscle problems. But what is happening at the level of the uh, of the heart cell is that. A, a, an enzyme pathway called PKG, protein kinase G, is protective of the uh, of uh, the, all of these bad uh, uh, all of these HEFPEF pathophysiology, and uh, we this is a well known way of how the PKG pathway works. Nitric oxide synthase synthesizes nitric oxide. It creates cyclic GMP, which then goes to PKG and protects the heart. Uh, what is interesting is that inside the cardiac myocyte, there is a whole parallel pathway that also uh, goes to PKG for, uh, from cyclic GMP, but it comes from the natriuretic peptide receptor. Interestingly, even though parts of the pathway are the same, cyclic GMP is just a molecule. However, they, the pathways are parallel to each other. They don't interfere with each other. This is because our collaborators were able to show that they could uh, block the two pathways by two different drugs. This pathway is interesting for us with uh, uh, menopause and so forth because the nitric oxide synthesis pathway uh, is triggered by estrogen, uh, this, uh, the, the large levels of premenopausal estrogen. And as estrogen goes down uh, to that really low level and with different biological effects, uh, this whole pathway uh, be becomes less and less relevant and the protection of the heart against all of these HEFPEF uh, pathophysiology is reduced. Okay, so uh, what we decide to look at is, is if this cyclic GMP is this key molecule in the middle of the myo uh, uh, heart cell, is it associated with protective effects on the heart? How does that play with uh, sex hormone levels? Uh, so this is in, in an observational study called MESA. Again, all of the people in MESA are uh, 45 years and older, 45 to 85 years. Most of them are postmenopausal. Uh, all the, almost all the women are postmenopausal. Men are th that age. Uh, so uh, the greater the cyclic GMP, the greater the uh, anti-pro uh, anti BNP. Now that is not very surprising because anti-pro BNP is supposed to uh, trigger uh, cyclic GMP formation inside the cell. Uh, and uh, I'm going to jump over here the greater the cyclic GMP, the greater the systolic blood pressure. So again, it is not looking like it is protective, but this we are not actually measuring cyclic GMP from inside the uh, inside the heart cell. We are me measuring it inside the blood. The fact that there's so much cyclic GMP being regurgitated into the blood means that the heart is under stress. It is reactive. So uh, we see that it's actually more cyclic GMP means uh, uh, worse uh, cardiovascular state. Interestingly, cyclic GMP only in women is also associated with uh, uh, testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, uh, and but not in men. So uh, let's see where, where this complication takes us. 
when we look at uh, uh, whether cyclic GMP, this key molecule we thought was associate uh, should be in the middle of the uh, heart cell protective. Is it protective when we measure it in the plasma? Uh, so when we look at those people with high cyclic GMP versus low cyclic GMP, the top third versus the middle, uh, the lowermost third, uh, the chance, the the, the uh, risk of heart HFPEF was 1.82 fold, so 82% higher. This was in a study called ARIC, which I've put the logo here. This is among older people. They, so everyone was older than 65, followed for 20 years. So lots of people had heart failure. So enough for us to do the, enough for the statistical models to work. Uh, and uh, when you adjust for all kinds of things, you see that it does not, uh, it just remains that uh, cyclic GMP is associated with uh, worse uh, heart, uh, HFPEF and a total heart failure as well. However, what we see is that when we try to adjust for, uh, for BNP, we see that the, uh, the association is much reduced, reduced so much that it is no longer statistically significant. So it gives us the sense that cyclic GMP, as it is regurgitated into the blood, is probably not the same thing as the protective cyclic GMP that is inside the, inside the cell, uh, heart cell, but it is uh, actually just a marker that if there's lots of uh, NT pro BNP, there'll just be lots of this regurgitated cyclic GMP. And we actually tested it. We tested it by saying that, that uh, NT pro BNP, which is a direct marker of cardiac stress, of course, if it is high, uh, uh, third, the top third versus the bottom third, much stronger. Uh, heart failure, there's almost 3.84 fold increase in uh, the risk of heart failure. And if you adjust for cyclic GMP, nothing, nothing changes. So what I think what uh, uh, we were able to tell our basic science colleagues is that even though they have a good mechanistic uh, hypothesis, they were able to show it in their cellular models. When it comes to intact human beings and measuring stuff in the blood, the cyclic GMP in plasma is just a side pathway from pro BNP, which is a marker of stress. Any intracellular cyclic GMP that may be protective is not actually uh, detectable in the plasma. So what do we think is happening in free living human beings, so especially in sex differences? A menopausal transition happens in women. They have lower levels of estrogen, higher le levels of androgen compared to estrogen. Uh, men don't have anything like that happening at that age. There is greater oxidative stress in postmenopausal women, and that uh, when there's more oxidative stress, nitric oxide cannot act as well. It, it's actually destroyed by uh, oxygen, uh, by stressful ox uh, oxidative stress. There are lower cyclic GMP levels inside the cell, but more regurgitated uh, cyc cyclic GMP outside as a reactive, uh, 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 and then uh, this causes the hypertrophy of the heart, which is maladaptive. It is not. Uh, in in the long term interest of the uh, of health and if uh, if one waits long enough that will re result in uh, in events of hefpef so we actually looked at this uh, in a different study called the cardia study the cardia study uh, uh, enrolled younger women and followed them for 30 years uh, uh, so these women were uh, enrolled before their menopause and then they were followed long uh, after their menopause. There were multiple echo measurements taken uh, and uh, before and after menopause. So we could, so we could, uh, this is just a cartoon. Uh, I will show real data in the next slide. Uh, to, we can say how fast any measure in the echo is changing before menopause and how fast it is changing in that woman or in the average woman after menopause. And if there is a difference, so this, if I, if it had just continued, it had gone along this dotted line, if there is a difference. So does menopause cause changes in the, uh, the trajectory of uh, how the heart is changing with age? And uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, left atrial volume. So the left atrium is the, uh, the smaller part of the atrium and it, it backs up when the, uh, when the uh, ventricle cannot pump uh, clear out blood as much as is needed, even though it clears out 
a percentage of the blood that is supposedly normal it does not clear out as much as needed and the left atrium grows big so what we saw uh, these are uh, all women uh, that are that started off young they had some uh, some trajectory of uh, the of uh, left atrial volume that's pretty much flat trajectory i would say because that is a 95% confidence interval is all over the place but after the uh, their menopause they had a uh, an increase in left atrium which means that the uh, the left atrium is backing up none of these women had uh, uh, frank overt heart failure but we can see the direction that uh, uh, that the direction is changing towards heart failure uh, in the long term uh, once menopause has happened uh, and uh, left ventricular mass uh, which is the re which is the reaction to higher stress it's act uh, it has also changed its trajectory it is not uh, in these women that, that don't show frank heart failure it is not increasing or anything but it tells you that it has changed its trajectory in a way that it could increase in the future but even at this stage it is backing up so that the uh, left atrium is now in, is increasing in size uh, to show that uh, it, it is not doing well so to summarize, uh, we had this wonderful theory about plasma cyclic GMP. It, it, the theory is proved in, uh, in animal models and cell models, but uh, we don't think that cyclic GMP, even though it might be the, uh, a, a mechanistic biomarker, it is not a marker that will be useful in, uh, in uh, human uh, observational human studies. But uh, higher cyclic GMP is actually a reflection of higher cardiac stress and higher uh, BNP, and so worse heart failure risk. And what we have shown is that menopause per se is related to the change in the trajectory of left ventricular mass and left atrial size that is consistent with uh, higher uh, HFPEF risk. Uh, this is my last slide, uh, and I, I want to thank all of the people at the Johns Hopkins Corridor for Population Research Corps. I used uh, research from all of these, uh, all of my colleagues. On one side, uh, these are my uh, colleagues on the faculties, uh, and on the uh, I've specially put us uh, on one side the uh, our wonderful trainees who. Uh, who put their heart into doing many of these studies and without them, the studies would not have been done. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, um, that, that, is, that is that for my talk. Thank you, Dr. Vaidya. Uh, very insightful, very, very in-depth uh, research and uh, obviously coming in. Uh, so I'll stop the sharing screen uh, if you can. Okay. Okay, so, uh, oh, the, our chair is here. I thought you were absent today. I, I, okay, so uh, so I'll quickly uh, acknowledge our members over here. Uh, we have about 22 participants. Um, so we have Mr. Chong, who is the chair for Simao. He is from Singapore Medical Association. We have Dr. Ravi Naidu from Medical, from Malaysian Medical Association. He's also the immediate past president of Simao. Uh, Professor Nazmi, first vice president and from Semao and president from LM, uh, sorry, uh, he's from Pakistan Medical Association. Dr. Elvin from Hong Kong Medical Association is the treasurer for Semao. Dr. Pele from India uh, and Me World Medical Council. Dr. Salma Kundi, president of Pakistan Medical Association. Dr. Angelique, South Africa Medical Association. Dr. Jamal Chaudhary, Bangladesh Medical Association. Uh, Dr. Mukti from Nepal Medical Association, Dr. Akhtar Hussain from South Africa Medical Association, uh, Dr. <coughs> Sajid uh, from Pakistan Medical Association, Dr. Prakash from Nepal Medical Association, Dr. Uh, Benti, uh, Benito from Philippines Medical Association, Dr. Deborah from Brazil Medical Association, uh, Dr. Marie from Japan Medical Association, Dr. Russell from UNESCO Australia, Dr. Shashank Joshi from India, uh, Dr. Bukhari from Pakistan, Dr. Monica from uh, USA, uh, Dr. Sanchita from India IGCP group. So, uh, and then we also have a lot of uh, our friends from uh, other part of the world, including um, Singapore, Malaysia, and all other areas. So I thank you for joining in and I thank you our presenter for 
giving us. So we will now uh, have question answers. Let's open it. If you have any questions and over to Dr. Chong also. Thank you. Thank you, Sarab. And thank you, Dr. Vajia, for your wonderful presentation. I mean, HEFPEF is a very interesting topic by itself. I just managed a couple of very bad, uh, very elderly HEFPEF patients. And unfortunately, they were in the 90s and they both perished, you know, eventually. But it's a very, very challenging uh, 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 um, problem. And I, I understand some of the cardiologists even feel that it's not a cardiology problem. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, my uh, colleagues at uh, the center often think, uh, think of it as uh, more like a, a whole body disease that affects the heart. So they say it is, it's actually a skeletal muscle and, uh, and adipose tissue disease that affects the heart. It's, uh, that's an interesting way. To, uh, that, that is an interesting and probably appropriate way to look at it. Yeah. I, that I, is probably why... Uh, the heart specific medications that work for reduced ejection fraction don't work for HEFPEF. I, I found very interesting is that, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just uh, I, asking my questions because you know I, I'm, I find it very interesting that this HEFPEF uh, entity, um, I find the fluid balance is very critical, you know, the intake output of the fluid in the, because you know, very often when, we, when you have very ill patients in hospitals, we don't really watch the I.O. charts that well, but I found that actually I.O. is critical to managing um, managing uh, these patients. And very often they run into problems because the I.O. is not properly managed. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I must just tell you that uh, my, uh, my work is that of an epidemiologist and especially at an uh, most of my work is much earlier at the risk factor stage. And so wow. what you tell me from your clinical experience is basically educational for me. Uh, uh, but uh, just to uh, uh, support what you're saying in terms of what the American Heart Association has been communicating with its patients, again, uh, COVID and heart failure is they have been asked uh, the, the, what you have been talking about uh, fluid uh, balance they have actually highlighted that in their communications with patients uh -huh. Uh -huh. as uh, and these are patients of course uh, who are at home not uh, hospitalized yeah. just uh, interesting yeah the other thing i found very fascinating was that uh, i found that uh, keeping the albumin levels high was very important uh, so you know expensive but iv albumin what what can i say so that's what we found in in these uh, half bad patients Albumin and strict I.O. control. That's what we found. And uh, honestly, uh, we found that diuretics uh, were very counterproductive. We found that, for example, I tried not to use too much of the Lasix and all this, you know, uh, I mean, you know, frusamide and all that, because I found it very, very counterproductive, you, you know, because their, their fluids were all over the place and using diuretics was just messing everything up. That, that's what we found. It's very valuable. Very, quite fascinating. Uh, I'd like to open the questions to the floor. Anybody from the floor has any questions for Dr. Vajaya? Did I pronounce that correctly, Dr. Vajaya? But you did, you did. Okay. I actually wanted to ask how to pronounce uh, your name because I tried okay. at the internet and okay. uh, and uh, I was like, well, I could get the Mandarin for it, but not the Singaporean for it. So there you go, Vajaya. Any questions Dr. Pillai. for the floor? Dr. Pillai. Yeah. Um, it, it's a very interesting presentation and uh, use a lot of information. Uh, the intervention, that is what uh, should be more interested. Uh, does exercise have a role in uh, reducing this eventuality? And is there any drug intervention for this? So the drug intervention, unfortunately, uh, uh, has been uh, uniformly bad news. A long term uh, earlier. Now we are talking of exercise, and like we, uh, like uh, Dr. Chong said, it is a very, uh, it is a whole body disease, and uh, skeletal muscle uh, and uh, adipocytes are involved. So at an early stage, uh, at the kind of time that I'm studying that, uh, uh, at the risk factor stage, I yes, exercise would be very important. I, uh, if it comes to people with frank heart failure, I would uh, uh, 
uh, I would ask clinicians to comment about how exercise is used in uh, people who are already in frank failure. Thank you. Any other questions for the floor for this uh, fascinating uh, disease entity? <laughs> um, um, is there any change? I'm just curious. Is there any change in the um, uh, recommendations? I mean, you know, for, for menopause and, and, and hormone uh, replacement therapy, is there any, or is, is the, everybody still looks at that famous study that, what, what do you call it? The Women's Health Initiative. Women's Health Initiative. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, that is that is still the uh, the law of the land because that is the uh, the gold standard of uh, a randomized clinical trial, and all uh, uh, the initial hype or uh, or optimism I would say because everyone wants good things to happen was coming from um, uh, observational studies uh, from uh, nurses, and what makes a at a time when hormone replacement therapy was not routinely given the kind of uh, uh, internal motivation that makes a person uh, a woman go and seek medical uh, therapy and say i want this was the sort of thing that probably uh, did all kinds of good things uh, health wise so now uh, people do say a couple of things that the uh, the kind of estrogen that was used in uh, the WHI, the CEE, may have may not be the appropriate one, and so forth. But I don't think anyone is getting ready to do a, a new trial. Another thing that I, I think uh, gets lost in the facts is that. Uh, 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 that the reason why uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy might be useful in many women is for perimenopausal symptoms. And no one actually said that, uh, the, that the Women's Health Initiative never tried to say or uh, that it wasn't good for, pre for perimenopausal symptoms. If it works for perimenopausal symptoms, what it only says is that if you're if it is not for perimenopausal symptoms, if you're trying to protect from long-term heart disease, it's probably going to be counterproductive. So that's the that's the thing. I think we more or less are trying to look at uh, menopause as a uh, as an educational moment and uh, like a uh, like if you have been uh, uh, unaware of risk factors reduction exercise this long uh, because being a woman is keeping you protected from heart disease. This is a time to wake up and uh, uh, and be uh, proactive about uh, one's health. So that's generally where uh, the preventive side of uh, the menopause research is going. Rather than, uh, I don't believe there are any other uh, there are any uh, clinical trials of uh, estrogen long term estrogen replacement therapy in progress. It's uh, it's quite quite. Um, I I remember this WHI made a huge impact. Although there's a lot of criticism about the way it was run and so on, but I think it's still out there and nothing's replaced it at the moment. Um, the Dr. Uh, Shashan Joshi have any questions for our esteemed speaker? <laughs> there's also some. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Joshi, and then there's, uh, there's someone in, uh, in the chat. So so great talk, uh, Jay, and um, uh, you know. You make some very interesting insights. Um, you know, the we have these modern age drugs called AGLD2 inhibitors. And at the European Society of Cardiology, just yesterday late night, we saw some uh, emperor preserved fraction, um, uh, you know, being presented. So in this in the era of these uh, big, big data trials, how do you use these uh, new age agents, uh, you know, in these situations? And do you feel that um, a woman post-menopausal are at risk for, um, you know, heart failure uh, with preserved ejection fraction. That's my second question. So uh, this, the second part, yeah. the second part, I'm, uh, I am, uh, uh, cautious, I'm giving a cautious uh, yes. At least that was true in the United States for much of the late last century, 20th century. What uh, my colleagues in the heart failure clinic have been finding now is that this uh, this old thought that uh, heart failure with 
preserve the Jack faction, all are these little old women, is no longer true. You see a lot of high BMI people, women and men, uh, who have preserved ejection fractions. So it is slowly shifting. Uh, what, what one thing you can say is it is a heterogeneous disease. So maybe you can say what is shifting is a different kind of disease that is manifesting in these uh, heavier men and women. Uh, but uh, what we have shown uh, with this very early changes in the heart is that we think that uh, that uh, after menopause, women are, uh, as compared to where their hearts were trending before menopause, their heart are trending towards HFPF after menopause. So that that part I will say yes, but I think the on the overall. Uh, men are also starting uh, to show with uh, HFPF and not just, uh, and also uh, the high BMI group is showing with HFPF. Um, Dr. Bajan, there's a very interesting data... question in the chat. Can you answer that? Ah, the andropause question. Uh, so, so andropause is a much less dramatic uh, event as compared to menopause. So perimenopause at most lasts for a year, a year and a little bit. Whereas uh, a change in uh, testosterone levels in men is a much more uh, gradual decline over many, many years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hypogonadism, uh, I mean, low testosterone levels, we have shown are associated with uh, worse cardiovascular, worse metabolic uh, outcomes and cardiovascular outcomes. So in that sense, I don't think it will be the same thing because it's a, it's a different biology, a completely different range of uh, testosterone levels, different re uh, receptor actions. So the biochemistry is going to be different. Uh, but uh, if the gradual uh, less uh, lowering of testosterone will result in more adiposity, more uh, metabolic uh, uh, dysmetabolism of glucose, more diabetes, uh, and uh, resultant cardiovascular disease. So in some sense, this, this long-term andropause will prob it'll probably be bad, but bad in a different way. Does that make sense? Thank you, Dr. Vajai. Can I just ask one last question for myself? Uh, that is, you know, it looks like it's a diastolic dysfunction in the heart because, you know, obviously the EF doesn't measure that very well. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Am I correct? Uh, yeah. Or it's not as simple uh, as that? So the, the, uh, there is a little bit of a controversy on whether to call it uh, diastolic dysfunction, preserved ejection. Preserved ejection fraction, at least in the colleagues that I've mostly talked about seems to be winning rather than diastolic. Some people call you, uh, there was used to call it diastolic heart failure. And I have ref used to be called systolic heart failure. I've seen that terminology kind of die out as the, the idea that it's a diastolic heart failure uh, becomes less useful in describing it. Uh, but uh, you can me measure diastolic dysfunction. Uh, people do measure it in uh, echocardiography, tish uh, tissue Doppler, and it it will show worse uh, uh, diastolic uh, 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 relaxation. So, but you, I mean, it's a stiffer heart, but it it does have a higher load on uh, that it is trying to uh, uh, bump against. And the fact of having a higher load to pump against uh, is also going to show up as diastolic dysfunction rather than primarily the diastole is problematic, so it is not pumping. It is not pumping, so the diastole. So the I think the chicken and egg is going towards the other side. Uh, so I, I think that's why HFPF as a terminology is winning out over diastolic dysfunction. Thank you. There's one question which is there in the, uh, yes, we are live on the Facebook. So there's one question which has come from the viewers, mm -hmm. uh, probably a non-medical. They say like, what is the early, uh, what is the early stage where like a person who is a non-doctor can, uh, you know, feel that there are some issues in the body and, and what time does he has to go to the, you know, 
go for our precautions and medicines and like that. Uh, is this uh, um, when it comes to heart failure? I think uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, this, uh, period that I am studying is long before the patient, uh, before a person is a patient. This is a health. These are the women that I studied are, uh, for all practical purposes, healthy women uh, and uh, men. Uh, the compar comparison men. So we are saying that the roughly the time of menopause for women is already a time for a not an alarm bell to ring in the sense that sit in the ambulance and go to the hospital, but the time for an alarm bell to ring that your heart is already starting to go in the wrong direction. So uh, if you have been uh, less uh, aware of how you can be protective, how you can have uh, a heart healthy lifestyle, that uh, that is this is the time to actually start changing the, uh, to incorporate that. So when it comes to my research, I think this is long before a, a patient has any complaints at all we, because we are we are uh, studying people where uh, the the shape and size of the heart is changing and the patient doesn't even know about it but they can uh, have a healthy lifestyle and improve their long term risk thank you very much um, dr vajai thank you very much for the presentation now i have actually some time so i'd like to go through my various uh, colleagues in the uh, different mas to just get an update on the situation of, of covid <laughs> in their in their countries um sarab can we uh, uh, shall we yeah. shall we start the ball rolling because we don't sure. have much time before the next meeting yeah so we have 20 minutes uh, we have exactly 20 minutes so we can quickly run through the uh, to the Upgrades from the medical association. Let's start. Maybe we start with Dr. Pillai from India and see whether he can tell us what's happening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, India, the second wave is still getting prolonged. But then, uh, whether it is a prolongation of second wave or the pandemic uh, becoming an epidemic, because uh, the number is contributed by two states, particularly Kerala, with a population of 2.5% of the total population. Uh, the contribution to COVID is almost uh, 60%. So it is more like an epidemic now. Uh, most of the other states, things are really under control. The emphasis the government is giving now is for uh, vaccination. And that definitely, uh, in one day, one crore population has been vaccinated. So that is the extent to which uh, the system is working uh, to sort of outweigh the disease. And uh, uh, totally, uh, the eligible population, 50% has had one, one dose, and 15% uh, had both the doses. So that is where we stand as far as vaccination is concerned. And uh, Delta variant is definitely the cause for persistence of the infection, particularly in the state where the maximum number is there, Kerala. Uh, almost 80% of the genomic studies show that it is because of Delta variant, AY1 and AY3. So uh, the uh, COVID appropriate behavior, more emphasis is being given and people are willing to accept vaccine and they are on their own coming. And definitely uh, the vaccination process will, is uh, much more enhanced and uh, uh, we may uh, achieve the target uh, by the year end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pillai. Um, I will come to Dr. Prakash next, but uh, can I just ask Dr. Joshi, um, Shashan Joshi, about the situation as well? Yeah, I think I agree with Dr. Pillai. Um, you know, 75% of cases are coming from Kerala, but uh, Maharashtra is contributing the second largest. But, you know, there is a fear that with the festive season coming up, and Kerala just finished Onam festival and there are a lot of festive seasons like, um, uh, you know, uh, which are likely to come up in the next couple of weeks. Government of India has put out a red alert uh, to ensure that there is COVID appropriate behavior. Uh, yesterday we broke a record. It is the largest uh, vaccination uh, drive in planet Earth. And I don't think uh, on any given day, 10 million doses were given on any part of the world. So I think Indian vaccination program has really picked up and now it's speaking up. Uh, we are also expecting a pediatric wave 
So we have one vaccine, which is a DNA vaccine, no. which is about for use uh, in India uh, for children about 12. And the data on 28,000 patients is uh, completed and that preprint is also, also available. So overall, we are cautiously optimistic. Uh, we feel that the third wave, if appropriate behavior is maintained, is likely to hit somewhere in October, November. I agree with Dr. Pillay that the genomic analysis from Maharashtra and Kerala shows that it is predominantly Delta, though in Mumbai city, we are getting a little bit of Kappa as well as a little bit of Delta plus, but none of them is reaching any critical significance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shoshi. Dr. Prakash, you want to tell us? Uh, what's yeah, 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 that's so. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, in uh, Nepal now, the posi uh, positivity rate is almost 15 to 20. But uh, we are uh, not in a spike, we can say that way. Because since the two, three weeks, the positivity rate is uh, 15 to 20, because generally those who are suspected, those who are in uh, uh, hospital, we are doing the test of that. But in the field, we don't have the such a high positivity rate. And uh, luckily, the northern part of India, they are in less infection and less casualty. That's why uh, we are also in safe. But uh, interestingly, in Nepal, the vaccination campaigning is going very good. And uh, almost 15 to 17 percent people are uh, double vaccinated. And uh, 30 percent people are got the single dose single vaccinated. That's why uh, the hospital facility and uh, others, they don't have the such uh, uh, high load, uh, high pressure. That's why uh, we are giving the much more emphasis in the vaccination program. And luckily, we are getting almost all the vaccines from the COVAX facilities and buying from the China also. And uh, Belayat also giving, Japan also giving, America is also giving. And uh, in the coming month, I think in the September, the uh, India is uh, also told uh, they will give to Nepal the vaccination. That's why I think by the end of one month, we almost 40% people will get vaccinated. And by the end of five months, we are planning to vaccinate all the people of Nepal. That's what we are doing and uh, going smoothly. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. We all need some good news. Uh, can I go to Pakistan next? Uh, uh, Prof. Ashraf, do you have something to say to us? I don't see Dr. Salma on the chat. chat. Uh, thank you very much. And Pakistan, luckily, now people have understood what is happening around uh, and what they have to do. Uh, Pakistan is now having the vaccination program and vaccination is in a very positive way. Although we are suffering from the implementation of SOPs what the government and the organizations like Pakistan Medical Association, we are asking the people uh, to opt for the SOPs, but unfortunately it is not that much effective. Still we have the celebrations, still we have all the meetings going on. And so from the government side or the public at large, these are the SOPs which has not been followed positively. Uh, what uh, news I would uh, like to share over here is that we are uh, now Pakistan has started and allowed the booster dose, although still it was first and second dose was free of course, but the government of Pakistan had decided to offer the booster dose and uh, one has to pay for that. This is what is all over there. In the cities of Pakistan, like Karachi, the thickly populated Lahore, we have some sort of uh, about positivity rate around 10. But overall in Pakistan, it is 7.5. We are moving in between 6 to 7 point. Control. I think we are losing uh, Prof. Prof. Ashraf. Yeah, thank you very much. I I, I think that uh, I have talked all about. So yeah. if you can listen me. So that is all from Pakistan. Dr. Sajjad, do you have something to tell us? Dr. Sajjad? Dr. Sajjad, are you there?
So it's okay. We can move to another countries now. Okay. Can uh, I don't see Dr. Chowdhury. So uh, can we move on to Angelique and uh, Dr. Hussein from uh, South Africa? Morning, morning to everyone. And thank you for a very informative um, presentation, uh, Jay. So from us, um, I will let Dr. Hussein give the stats. Um, we have been a bit more successful this past week in the vaccinations or um, since we have opened for the 18 year pluses i think it brings more families now to our vaccination centers um, we are busy looking at the possibility of our healthcare workers who had johnson and johnson vaccine in february whether we should give them a booster before december as we predict our fourth wave to be in december and we are also looking at regulations um, in the workplace uh, where um, especially um, in certain areas where you have people working with the public whether that sh they should be um, come you know compulsory vaccination um, from the employer to the employees and what are their rights um, you know South Africa's got a very uh, um, a constitution that everyone's got rights, um, a very broad constitution. So we are looking at that. And um, on the political side, we're a bit stable, this more stable this week in the, uh, or this past two weeks in the Department of Health, although our regulator, our Health Professionals Council of South Africa is going through a rough page again. Um, but let's see what happens. Um, all in all, nothing really changed, but I'll give um, over to Dr. Hussein. Hussein. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, in South Africa, last 24 hours, we have 12,045 case, new cases and 367 deaths in last 24 hours. In South Africa, so far, total reported 2.7 million cases and the recovery is 2.4 million. And the total death till now, 80,826. And still 169,000 active cases of COVID. So average, we are doing tests around 58 to 60,000 per day. And our positivity rate is 19.0 percentage. It was 23 last week. So there is improvement here. And in some province like Kerala, in KZN and Durban is almost 30%. And total admission in the hospital last 24 hours, 13,646 13, new patients. And around the country, uh, the high care admission is 1,900. And ICU is 1,053 cases. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, sorry to hear all these grim statistics, uh, Dr. Hussein. Can I move next to uh, Japan? Uh, Marie, are you there? Yes, thank you very much. Now we are testing about 20, uh, 25,000 people are tested positive, but uh, this rate is still very low. And recently, we are um, uh, doing the mixture of the antibody um, cocktail therapy. And it's, I heard that it's quite successful, especially for the uh, who is likely to get severe. But we are still have uh, uh, my lockdown all over the country. And uh, we will see what will happen next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Marie. Uh, Ravi, do you want to tell us what's happening in Malaysia? Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Chong. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Vadia, for the lovely talk. But anyway, Malaysia, we are still status quo. We are still uh, seeing more than 20,000 cases. Uh, we are seeing record number of deaths. Yesterday, we saw 339 deaths. But the only consolation is about 60% of the adult population have been vaccinated. That is a bit of a consolation. However, the government is still emphasizing on the SOPs like wearing a face mask, maintaining social distance. And we are still in a lockdown. 
at the moment, what is happening is uh, we are not allowed to conduct meetings. So, you know, AGM call are all virtual. No physical meetings. And uh, dining in, they have started allowing two to a table. But only those who are fully vaccinated will be allowed to enter the restaurants. And uh, also that at least 80% of the employees of that particular establishment must be fully vaccinated. That means two doses. Uh, on a lighter note, we have just got our ninth prime minister. I think uh, my dear friend in Singapore will be updating our, himself with our politics here. And we have a new health minister and we are hoping that uh, these people will be more committed to, to handling and settling the problem that we're having with the COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Dr. Russell from Melbourne, uh, how, uh, you've got something to update us? Yeah, well, uh, the, the story is the uh, same. Uh, Australia is uh, dealing with the um, Delta, uh, and uh, we seem to be split. Half the country is free, and the other half, uh, New South Wales and Victoria, we had, I think, some 70 cases or so, uh, 64 today, and New South Wales are 1,000 and so um, in the bigger picture, it doesn't look big, but in the other places, as you know, West Australia, the other states have zero. And uh, so there's barriers, no one's opening up, and uh, we have this major discussion going. Vaccination is going on well, and uh, they expect 80% to be there by October, October, November, when there's some talk of opening up. But they have now started... Uh, 12 to 15 years it's been accepted so they're starting that from next week they're going to be uh, immunized and so forth we haven't had any deaths in new south in victoria but <laughs> some deaths are there, not like what it used to be i think due to the immunization so but still um uh, victoria new south wales and uh, austrian capital territory are under lockdown and there's it's also moved to the regional areas in both New South Wales and Victoria. So that's the situation not getting better. The, the um, um, Delta seems to take a not We're not able to, they're not able to, and there's a question, argument of whether you want uh, elimination or we want to live with, the, you know, have a suppression and that uh, half the states want it to be eliminated or below 30. Uh, the Doherty Institute uh, has given some epidemi you know, a way out program wanting it to, to reach 80% and then to open up borders and so forth. So that's the program, whether that will happen by the end of the year, where they plan to open the country up after that. So that's the situation here. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Russell. Very challenging situation. Uh, yes, and, and very because there was no, we had hardly anything for the last so many months, and suddenly this has happened, yeah. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Um, Dr. Benito from Philippines, you have one, something to update us, Dr. Benito? Dr. Benito, you are on mute. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, you're mute again. Our updates is uh, ongoing every four o'clock in the afternoon. That's why I will give you the update yesterday. As of yesterday, of August 27, we have a total number of positive cases for that day, seven, 17,447. Uh, the highest uh, was 18,000 last week. And we have a total number of deaths yesterday of 113 with a total number of positive cases since last year of 1.7 million and total number of deaths is 1.7 percent 32,941 as, as of yesterday that's all thank you dr benito and uh, just to update everyone singapore we've uh, we've hit about uh, 80 79 percent uh two doses of vaccination 79 percent of the population 83 percent have received uh one dose so uh we're still trying to close the gap desperately and delta is proving to be very very difficult to control in singapore we have 100 over cases a day now still despite all our intensive measures very very difficult situation and again i think the the debate is going on globally whether zero tolerance versus 
living with it, endemic, you know, that there's always the issue. So I think uh, I've come to the end of the... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm... Hello? Hey, Alvin, sorry. You, Alvin, yeah. Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> Our <laughs> best <Yeah>. friend. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though the travel bubble is now burst, we are still uh, liaising uh, each other about this um, pandemic travel, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, well, in Hong Kong, uh, we're still uh, lagging behind uh, Singapore a lot. We only have about 60% of our population with the first dose, uh, less than 60%, and only about 40% with the second dose. And so we still have a glim hope <laughs> uh, that we could have 70% uh, of uh, vaccination in the population uh, at the end of September, okay? But of course, uh, the uh, fifth wave in Hong Kong had not yet arrived, uh, thank God. So we still have uh, 12,000 cases uh, confirmed so far with 212 deaths, 212 deaths all uh, so far. But then uh, I think um, we still will have to persist in the strategy of zero tolerance because um, we have only 20 less than 20% of our elderly being vaccinated. Uh, so it's dangerous for them if we open up. And even for the young age group, um, less than 29 years of age group is uh, only about 30%. Uh, so mainly it's the middle age group that had the very high uh, vaccination percentage. So um, one of our professors, uh, uh, he said that uh, he would expect 97% of our population being vaccinated if we really want to have a meaningful herd immunity for Hong Kong, uh, because uh, the Delta variant is so dangerous. So, um, so that's why we still have to keep our zero tolerance approach now. But then uh, we have encouraged more dutiful, dutiful, that is not mandatory vaccination. But for those high risk uh, professions, uh, we would expect, um, quote unquote, like a mandatory vaccination, but it's not mandatory. That is the other option of vaccination is like uh, 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 um, change to another job, change to another position, or you need to have a weekly uh, testing. Uh, that is the um, uh, intranasal and uh, nasopharyngeal um, PCR. And then um, we would have to um, ask the say airport staff, teachers, hotel staff, that is the uh, quarantine hotel staff, uh, elderly uh, center staff, all the health workers, they would need to have uh, vaccinations uh, if they really want to uh, continue with their job and no need to have the uh, weekly testing. So I, I think, um, with such an approach, of course, there are objection and opposition voices in our society. But then uh, I think um, the Hong Kong Medical Association, uh, we had encouraged people uh, in these professions to have dutiful vaccination. That is, we are mindful of the needs of our uh, patients, of our clients, of our students, etc. cetera. And, um, at least in the hospital authority, that is the public hospital sector, 98% uh, of the doctors were already vaccinated. And that is a very good example. And nurses only had 70% uh, of the nurses had uh, been vaccinated. And the other general staff in the hospital authority also only got about 70%. And we hope that um, the healthcare workers uh, could really have the duty to have the vaccination. But in the private, there's no control at all, no, no requirement at all. So in the private sector, it's really not satisfactory, I, I would think. At least we need to have the data, but then uh, it's all free. So I don't know how, how much, how many percent 
of our private health workers had got the vaccination. But anyway, I think, uh, 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 and international news is, of course, uh, Nicole Kidman, who came to Hong Kong being exempted of the uh, quarantine. Uh, but then it kicked up a, a lot of fuss. And uh, our, our Minister of Health had been bombarded all around it. But anyway, uh, I think exemption at the border is really dangerous. Just yesterday, we have uh, we had 15 cases of imported Delta. 13 were from an Indonesian ship. And luckily, they were not exempted of testing and quarantine. Uh, and the government had now been tracing whether they, they, they are using fake, uh, fake, fake reports fake vaccine passports, etc. I mean, that is a real problem because if we open up our border, we cannot control if anybody could have got hold of some fake certificates. And then uh, that would be a problem if we have the exemption of we, we had opened up the border. So that's our uh, dilemma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Alvin. Thank you, sorry to miss you up. But uh, we all have the um, CMAO meeting on the 2nd of uh, September. So I look forward to everyone seeing everybody at our CMAO meeting, uh, 2nd and 3rd of September. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we will end this session. We have another session waiting for us. And uh, this was thank the 73rd session. Uh, we, will, we will close the session. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thank you, our speaker from John Hopkins University for joining in for the wonderful session.